Welcome, everybody. My name is Elena G. Levine. I'm president of Quantum Success Solutions, and I'm author of the forthcoming book, Networking for Nerds, which is being published by Wiley this spring. It is such a delight today to talk with you about how you can prepare for an interview, and I'd like to express appreciation to our sponsors today, the AIP Career Network, for hosting this webinar. A couple of housekeeping issues before we get started. First of all, if there's any challenges that you have with hearing me or seeing the screen, simply log out and log back in. And you can also try calling. Instead of using your, your computer, you can try calling in using the phone number that was in your confirmation email that you received. There's a questions panel for you to ask questions. We'll be answering questions at the end of the webinar. And for questions that I don't get a chance to actually answer because of the time allotted, I will be producing a follow-up article about interviewing and what you need to know to be successful that will answer any questions from this webinar that we do not get a chance to answer today. That article will be in physics today, and so and all of your questions will be anonymized. In other words, any personal information will be stripped out. So you can feel free to ask questions via the question panel or email me even later to ask me a question that you'd like to have answered in that Physics Today article. And then finally, I just wanted to let you know that we are recording today's webinar, so you'll be able to go back later and review it and um, remember what are the major points that you would like to be, uh, that you'd like to keep in mind. So our topic today is the interview, what you need to know to do before, during, and after to get the job. And here we go. I'm excited. So what the most important thing you should know as we start off today is that Everything you do at all times in the job selection process influence you getting the job. So interviews are not actually just the interview itself, and we're going to talk about that in just a moment. We're going to talk about interviews, what you need to do before the interview, during the interview, and even after the interview to get the job, because you are on stage the entire time. In other words, there's a spotlight being shined on you that is making it clear to the audience, in this case the job, the, the, uh, the hiring manager or the decision maker of the organization in which you endeavor to work, they're watching you very carefully throughout this entire process. And so we want to make sure that throughout the entire process they see you as somebody who would be an asset to their team. Okay, so a couple of quick quizzes before we get into the meat and potatoes of this webinar. First of all, resumes or and CVs, it doesn't matter which one, resumes and CVs are to interviews, as interviews are to what? And the most important thing I want you to think about here is that interviews get you jobs. So your resume or your CV, your curriculum vita, while it is extremely important in the job selection process and in the job finding process, it does not get you the job. It gets you an interview. Because the resume, the CV, is a marketing document that entices me, the decision maker of the job, to want to learn more about you. And how do I learn more about you? I learn more about you through an interview. So I get enticed. I want to learn more. So I invite you for an interview to see how you would fit in with the culture of my organization. So don't ever think that you can skip the, the, that uh, wonderful step of being in an interview. The resume gets you the interview where the CV gets you the interview, and the interview is what gets you the job. So when does the actual interview, quote unquote, begin? And a lot of people think it begins when you walk in the door, or if you're doing a Skype interview or a telephone interview, the moment you pick up the phone or the moment that you log into Skype. But as I just sort of hinted at a few moments ago, the interview actually began a lot longer before. It began a lot long time ago. It began a lot uh, began way longer before than, than that moment. It actually began when you had your first connection, your first contact with somebody from that organization, that university, that department, that institution, that lab, that company, whatever it is. It began when you first had that interaction, that very first interaction with somebody from that organization. And if we want to extrapolate it even further, we could even say that the interview began the moment that you had an interaction within your community. So as a physicist, the moment you started giving talks, the moment you started writing papers, the moment you started networking and interacting with other physicists in your subdiscipline or even in your discipline. It's that important to remember 
And that's why it goes back to that idea that you're constantly on stage. So the moment you start making interactions, having interactions with people, people are making impressions about you. They're deciding what they think about you. They're judging you at that very moment. And that is when the interview begins. So we want to make sure that throughout all of your contacts, all of your connections, all of your communications with people in the community and within, more specifically, within the organization in which you'd like to work, that you are making a good impression. So, of course, the corollary to this is when does the interview end? And this also is a trick question, but I know you know the answer to this. There's actually two answers. The first answer is to when the quote-unquote interview ends. It ends only when an offer has been extended to you and both parties, you and the decision maker, have agreed on the terms and have now decided that you will be working there. So in other words, after the negotiation, it is when the interview ends. The interview does not end when you walk out the door. It ends after the negotiation has been finalized and an actual term sheet has been decided between you and the other party as to what you will be getting in exchange for you doing this job. That's when the interview formally ends. But you and I both know that the interview, in a certain respect, never ends. It is an infinite process. And what I mean by that is that every day when you go into work, you are interviewing to come into the next day of work. So it's just something to think about that people are always judging you, always making sure that you are being an asset, that you are delivering value to their organization. So what is the biggest job mistake, the biggest mistake that job seekers make is that they think that the job search process is about them. So now let's put me in this equation for a moment. I'm the job seeker, and I'm trying to get a job, right? So it's about me. I need something from you. You're the decision maker. I want to get something from you. I want to extract something from you. I want to get a job from you. It's about me. It's about me, me, me. No, that is incorrect. That's a mistake to think that way. The actual answer to this is the opposite. And the job search process is never about you. It's about what you, the job seeker, can do for me, the decision maker. Okay? It's what can you do for me, the decision maker? What problems can you solve better than anybody else? What makes you singularly better? And what makes you have better or more, uh, more exciting attributes and talents and experience and expertise that can solve the problems that I have in my organization more efficiently, more effectively, and to produce something very special, maybe novel, take my, my work in novel directions. What can you do to advance my mission? So that's what the job search process is about. It's about what you, the job seeker, can do for me. And if you approach your interviewing with that thought, that I want to find out how I can help you, the decision maker. I want to find out what problems you have and how I, with my experience, my unique blend of expertise and skills and my pedigree and credentials and everything I've done, will enable your organization to move forward. Then you'll find that your interviews will actually start getting you job offers. Okay? Because the job process, the interview process, is about what you can do for me and how you can explain that to me. And if you can communicate that to me, then you're giving yourself a very distinct advantage. So the last, I think this is the last quiz. Why does somebody get hired for a job? First of all, they get hired to, to solve problems. No matter what job you are going for, I don't care if you're going for a professorship, a president, a custodian, it doesn't matter. Whatever job you are going for, you are being hired to solve problems. And that is the number one thing that people are hired for. And therefore, when you go in for your interview, if you can communicate what problems you have solved, what the solutions were that you came up with, and what were the results of your solutions, you immediately give yourself a competitive advantage. Because most people don't think that way. They don't think, I'm a problem solver first and foremost. And they don't know how to communicate and articulate how their experience has set them up for success to solve problems in this new ecosystem. But you now know that, and you know how to do that, and you'll know how to do that more from this webinar, and that's the key. Being able to communicate that you can solve my problems. That's how you win in an interview. So another reason that somebody gets hired for a job, and this is what I mean by this is, if I am interviewing you, what influences my decision to actually bring you into my company or bring you into my department? So number one, I'm looking to see can you solve the problems of the organization. Number two, 
I'm looking to see can you and will you add value to the organization immediately. In other words, all of your experiences, all of your expertise, everything that you've done in the past has now set you up for success so that when you join my organization, my department, my research group, my lab, whatever it is, you immediately will start advancing the mission of the organization. Now, of course, I recognize it will take you a few moments, uh, and I mean that, you know, obviously metaphorically, to, you know, find your way around, to find where the bathroom is, to recognize, you know, who are the different people that are in the company or in the lab or in the research group. But in general, I know that when I hire you from our interview, that you'll be able to solve problems associated with my organization from day one. And that's what I'm looking for. And if you can demonstrate that in the interview, that also helps you to get the job. And the final piece of this puzzle is why do I make a decision to hire you for a job? You know, I'm hiring you to solve problems. Am I hiring you because you're going to add value immediately? And here's the kicker. The last piece of the puzzle is I'm hiring you because you're going to make me look good in front of my boss. In other words, you always hear the, sta the statement when you ask people who are really successful, who are leaders of companies and teams or research groups that are just amazingly productive and successful in what they've done. You ask them what makes them so successful. Almost everybody will answer one of the reasons that makes them so successful is because they are surrounded by great people, by talented people, and they've made that an imperative point in their career to surround themselves with talented people. Well, because that makes them look good. When you do great and you're part of my team, you're making me look good to my boss. So quite honestly, if that's what's going to happen, if that's the bottom line, I'm thinking about that as I'm interviewing you. As I'm interviewing you, I'm thinking, how are you, the job seat, going to help me look good in front of my boss? And so if you can communicate that too, you're not going to say, hey, I'm going to make you look good in front of your boss, but you're going to communicate it in, by t in the way, in the following way, by telling me and articulating to me what it is that you can do for my company and my organization or my research group. That's going to help me understand why you would be a good member of my team, a productive member of my team, and how you'd make me look good in front of my boss. Okay, so we're talking about the pre-interview part. How do we get, how do we prepare for the interview itself? So we have to get an interview, obviously. And I want to start off by saying that you should be taking a look at these niche job sites. Now, of course, you know about the larger job sites that are run by different publications and things of that nature that list all sorts of different types of science and engineering and mathematics jobs. No doubt those are useful, too. But what I have found is that the niche job sites, which not only have ads directly specifically for you, for people with your interests and your specific goals, not only do they have the ads where you can find out about jobs, but the ads themselves and the career centers, these niche job sites like the ones you see in front of you, actually have hidden information that can help you understand the industrial landscape or the hiring landscape that's taking place or that's happening right now. So like, for example, if you were to go to the APS Physics Job Center website, you could take a look and see what, what companies are hiring people with physics degrees. And you might notice that companies that, that are particularly, let's say, oil and gas companies seem to be hiring more and more physics majors, people with physics degrees. That is very useful information for you to know because it tells you that the industry is growing. It tells you that there's a lot of opportunities there. And then you can take that information to start researching oil and gas companies from those ads that you see at that niche job site. So look for ads to find places to send cover letters to, absolutely, and look for ad, these niche job sites to find ads to actually apply for jobs, but also mine them for this fantastic information about your in chosen sector or industry or discipline so you can understand what's going on and what are the hiring trends so you can really leverage your ability and your ability to succeed in the job search process. So now we're going to talk a little bit about getting the interview. And so in addition to you know, going and applying for the jobs that you see advertised, you want to also network. And what I mean by that is you want to reach out to contacts and your contacts' contacts to find an insider within the organization, within the company or the department or even in the research group, so that you can find out opportunities that might exist that might not be advertised, to find out about opportunities that are going to be coming, that are going to be opening up, and also to get, in, hidden, to get hidden information about what's going on within the culture of the organization. 
right? So for example, going back to that, you know, that idea, that niche site, with any of those niche sites, you could find that you could apply for a job, let's say with company X, but then as you mine your contacts and your context contacts, you find out that maybe perhaps a former postdoc from your research group now works for company X. And you could contact him or her and ask them for an informal conversation or an informational interview to learn a little bit more about the company, to learn a little bit more about that organization. You know, how, how are things organized there? How do they do the, the, the research? Is there multidisciplinary research? How are the teams actually organized in terms of function or in terms of, of uh, different areas? Uh, you know, is there travel involved? What types of projects do you work on? So you want to get all this information, this inside information, so that when you're writing your cover letter and you're preparing for your interview, you actually will be showing how informed you are about that organization, about that company. And that's really what helps you to get the job. That's what helps you to get the interview, and then that's what helps you get the job. So you can also use social networking sites, and in particular, I really highly recommend LinkedIn groups to find out information about different companies, different organizations, to find people to connect with in companies and in organizations that you might want to work for or work with. And again, ask for the, the code word is informal conversation or informational interview, because that tells me that although you're trying to get a job in my organization, you're not trying to get a job from me personally. You just want information from me, and therefore I'm going to be more, ha more apt to have that conversation with you than if you just emailed me and said, I want a job in your company. Do you know how I can get a job in your company? How can I get a job in your company? Remember, that's of the mark of somebody who's thinking only about what they can get from me. It's not about that, right? It's what you can do for me. And that's the same thing here. So you'll email them in advance. You'll make the, have these conversations. They'll be short, maybe 20 minutes, and then you'll send them a thank you note because you'll stay connected. So let's talk a little bit about that cover letter because how annoying is the cover letter? Let me tell you, it's one of the most annoying aspects of applying for a job. We all know that's true. And I'm sorry that we have to write it, but you know what? There's always a chance that they will read it, so we do have to write the cover letter. So what are we going to do in the cover letter? How can we make our cover letter really pop so that the hiring manager and the decision maker will get really excited and want to bring us in for an interview? So definitely we want to be proactive and we want to show in the cover letter that we have done research on the company or the organization or the department or whatever it is. You need to show in your letter that you know about the department, you know about the company, what, they, what they're doing, what their products are, or what their projects are, or what kinds of facilities they have. Say something specific about the department or the organization so that I know as the reader, as the hiring manager, as the decision maker reading your cover letter that you have a real stake in my company. You're not just applying for this because it's listed somewhere or that you're desperate for a job. You are really interested in my company and your clarity in showing me what it is that you know about my company, it actually solidifies for me your commitment to my organization. And since the interview process is all about what you, the job seeker, can do for me, the decision maker. If you can say that in the cover letter, if you can give me examples of problems that you've solved, solutions you've come up with, and results of your solutions, and then do the following. I call it the, the fourth piece of that. I call it the spin back, where you say how your experience solving these problems, getting these results, uniquely prepares you for success in my company in the following ways. That's what I mean by the spin back. So problem, solution, results, spin back, where you tell me how your problem, solution, results have uniquely prepared you for success in my organization. If you do that and then talk a little bit about my organization, I'm going to be interested. I'm going to want to read, for, me read more, and I'm going to want to read your CV or resume, and I'm going to want to invite you in for an interview to have a conversation. And this is important not only because you want to show them that you're committed to the organization, but you want to connect the dots for them. Help them see in black and white why you are the right professional for the job. And so by talking about your experience in the context of their facilities, their projects, their products, their services, whatever it is that they output, you actually give yourself, again, a competitive advantage. And you can even do it better by using their language using their vocabulary. So now, the vocabulary is important. 
and you'll find out what the right vocabulary is for your cover letters and for your interviews when you're doing these informational interviews, when you're doing your research at these niche job sites and elsewhere, within the LinkedIn groups and elsewhere, because you'll start seeing how people refer to different uh, aspects of the job, aspects of the company, aspects of the organization. So let me give you a quick example of what I mean by the language and why this is so important. So my background is math and physics, and my first job after I graduated from the University of Arizona with my bachelor's degree was working for the University of Arizona Physics Department as the Director of Communications. So I, work, I graduated and I immediately began working in science communications in the Physics Department. And as I was looking for jobs outside of academia, as I advanced in my career, I started adjusting my resume a little bit. And what I did was, especially because I wanted to look for jobs outside of academia, specifically in industry, I adjusted my resume and I adjusted my cover letter and started using vocabulary words that were used by the industry that I was interested in going into. For example, one of the things that I had done in the physics department was I had created and launched a strategic marketing campaign that promoted the, the graduate program for the physics department at the U of A to potential graduate students. And within the first year of that campaign, we had a 100% increase in applicants to our program. So that's a pretty good problem solution result, right? The problem was that the program had to be better promoted. The solution was that I came up with this, this very specific and strategic and multifaceted marketing campaign. And the result was we had a 100% increase in graduate student uh, applicants. Now, when I applied for jobs outside of academia, I changed a word, I changed a couple of words on my resume referring to that particular success that I had, and in my cover letter, I stopped calling them students. I stopped saying I had a 100% increase in students. I started saying I had a 100% increase in customers. I started saying a 100% increase in customers. In other words, of course, within a university, the customers are the students. Students are the customers. But I needed people outside of academia, in industry, in companies, to understand that I knew what their problems were. And I knew what the bottom line of their businesses were, which is making customers happy and in recruiting more customers. So by simply changing the word student to customer, which is their vocabulary, they knew that I would be able to solve their problems. I connected the dots for them by talking to them in their language, in the cover letter and in the resume. And in fact, it got me interviews and it got me job, uh, job offers. So remember to use their language connect the dots for them, show them what it is that you can do for them in their language, and then customize, customize, customize that cover letter. If you know, for example, having done your research, that this, you know, this particular research department or this particular uh, you know, um, university has the best type of facilities for astronomers because they have an observatory, then please mention that. Mention that in your cover letter and then discuss it in your interview. But don't keep it just about yourself. It has to be taught, you have to talk at least a little bit about what it is about me, about my organization, about my company that you find special. So we're going to be prepared. We're going to prepare, 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 prepare. I can't em over em emphasize how over prepared, um, you can never be over prepared for an interview. Let me just say that. So what we're going to do is we're going to research the organization beforehand to the max. We want to understand its history, the current issues, the news, the profits and losses. P&Ls is common vocabulary in industry. I want to understand how the organization is managed, its organization, its locations, its products. I also want to understand the competition and the industrial landscape and the corporate culture. And you know, once I applied, once, once I had uh, expressed interest in applying for a job as a public relations specialist with a cable company, in Tucson, Arizona, and I had applied for the position. And to prepare for the interview, I had read their, the, uh, the cable company's annual reports going back three years. So I had all of this information that you see in front of you. I got it from the annual reports. And by the way, every public company in the United States, and I'm sure abroad as well, have to produce annual reports, which almost always are on their websites. If they're not easily accessed, they are easily accessed through the web, through another type of another portal, or even through your institution's library. 
But there's amazing information that you can find out about organizations, particularly universities and companies, even private companies you can find out about. And if you incorporate this information into your interview, it's really going to impress me. So as we prepare for the interview, we've got to remember that they're going to be asking us questions. And I want to pause here for a moment and just talk to you a little bit about the idea behind questions in an interview and why people actually ask questions. So when I'm in an interview, when I'm the, I'm the decision maker and I'm interviewing you, what I'm trying to do in the interview is I'm trying to assess a couple of things. First of all, if you've made it to the interview, you probably have already worked with a hiring manager. So there's a difference between a hiring, and there's often a difference between a hiring manager and a decision maker in the interviewing process. The hiring manager is usually somebody who is trained in human resources. They work for the human resources division of the company or university or the government lab or whatever that you want to work for. They have experience in looking at, in hiring and even letting people go and benefits and things of that nature. But they have knowledge of what to look for in resumes and cover letters that can clarify, is this person a potential candidate for the decision maker to make a decision? And the decision maker is usually the technical expert. So they're usually the team leader. They would usually be your boss. So you'll be interviewing with your boss, who is the decision maker. They make the final decision. And the hiring manager handles the logistics of the actual hiring process. OK, so now what happens is, is that since the decision maker is usually a technical expert, they are not trained in human resources. So they don't necessarily know exactly how to put together an interview and ask the right questions to get information from you that will help them make a decision. I'm just being honest with you. They just don't have the training. So this gives you an advantage if you prepare for what are called typical interview questions, because I guarantee it. Although the human resources professional, the hiring manager, may interview you, do a pre-interview and ask you some basic questions about your skills and stuff, the decision maker has not had experience in human resources, so they don't know exactly what questions to ask except for some technical questions, right? Especially if you're applying for a very technical related job, like where you will be writing computer code, they will be asking you computer coding questions. They may even ask you to solve an actual mathematical or computer problem right there and then. But other than that, they will Google the words, quote unquote, typical interview questions, almost sometimes even five minutes before you walk in the door, to find the questions to actually ask you for the interview. So if you actually go and Google those questions too, Google typical interview questions, you'll get a boatload of questions that you can add, look at. You can prepare really, really strategically well for these interviews where people will ask you these questions. And some of these questions I think are kind of silly, um, and I'm going to go over those in just a moment. Some of these are not silly, but I guarantee you that they will ask you some of these questions, which is why you want to prepare. And you really want to practice also, which I'm going to talk about more in a moment. So an example of a typical interview question is, what is your greatest weakness? Right? What is your greatest weakness? Now, what are you going to answer? Are you going to actually tell them, my greatest weakness is, I hate to work with people. People are the worst. Are you going to tell them, I never take a shower. I take a shower every three weeks if I care to. You know, or I don't work well with people who delegate authority or, or delegate tasks to me. You're not going to tell them something negative about yourself. So what you're going to do is you're not going to lie. I never tell people to lie, ever. Instead, you're going to answer a different question. Okay? If somebody asks you, what is your greatest weakness, I'm going to say, my greatest weakness is if you give me a problem to solve, I will solve it no matter what it takes. I will work nights, weekends, holidays, overnight, whatever it is, until that problem is solved, my eye will be on that ball. That is my greatest weakness, that I will always solve the problem. Now, is that a weakness? No, that's actually a strength. So I answered a different question when they asked me, what is your greatest weakness? I they told them what, what money money strengths are. But I want to let you know, where did I get the answer to that question? I actually pulled a couple of human resources professionals that I've met through networking, and I asked them this question, and I presented them this answer, and they said that that was a fantastic answer. Because it actually did give the person who was interviewing me insight into what it is that I do. 
Now, if they insist and they say, come on, Elena, no, seriously, what is one of your weaknesses or what's your greatest weakness? Then what you can answer is something simple, an actual thing, like a task or, or a skill that you can easily remedy and have already started to remedy. For example, what's your greatest weakness? Well, you know, I know in this job that I'm applying for right now, it's really important for me to know C++ and Java and R. And I know C++ and I know Java really well. R, I'm not as good at, but I've actually started to remedy that by learning it myself. I'm teaching myself R, so by the time I join your team, I will be able to go and already start programming in R. So that's a great answer to that question, what's your greatest weakness? You gave me a very specific thing that you're weak in, but you're telling me already how you're improving yourself, which also gives me insight into your attitude and behavior. Another typical interview question is, where do you want to be in five years? And the answer to that is, I want to be here, right? You want to be here. You're committed to this organization. You're committed to this company. I'm very interested in growing my career with your company, with your organization, with your team, and that's where I want to be. And of course, I understand that for, from somebody who's applying for a postdoc, that's not necessarily going to be the answer, right? You don't want to be in the same postdoc five years later. But what you want to do is emphasize that you're, you want it uh, in this postdoc experience, I'm, I, my aim is to gain experience and expertise and skills so I can move my research into the next phase and work with you in a new direction. That is a great answer to that question. So the other thing about interview questions that you can prepare for are these things called behavioral questions. And I'd like to thank my colleagues with the AAPM, in particular Robin Miller and Meineke, who had done some research on this and had presented a talk on behavioral-based interview questions. Um, they did this, uh, they put together a list of behavioral-based interview questions um, used for, by permission, with permission by Dr. Collins from the University of Cincinnati College of Medicine. And so what behavioral-based interview questions are, are questions that address, that show me as the decision maker or the, the hiring manager in the interview, it shows me how your past behaviors are predictors of your future behaviors. So I'm going to ask you questions that are going to help me understand how you would behave in certain types of situations, scenarios, even with st certain types of stimuli, to show me how you would actually handle that challenge. So for example, if I was going to ask you a question where I wanted to better understand your behavior in terms of goal setting, a great example of a behavior-based interview question that would help me get information about that would be this. Why don't you tell me about an important goal that you've set in the past and what you did to accomplish it? That's a great question. If I wanted to understand a little bit more about your communication and interaction skills uh, and how your behavior would, would be relating to those areas, I might ask you, what experience have you had with miscommunication with a customer or a colleague and how did you solve that problem? If I wanted to understand how you approach risk, I might ask you, give me an example of a situation in which you took a calculated risk in a recent position. What were your considerations? Those are behavioral-based questions. You can Google that as well. That you should be preparing for, too, because they will ask you those questions. They want to know how you would behave in certain scenarios, and these are the questions that they ask. And by the way, many years ago, when I was uh, graduating from college, my, my very first major interview before I ended up taking the job with the University of Arizona Physics Department was with Intel Corporation. And um, they flew me up to Phoenix from Tucson, which is, which is funny because it's a 20-minute uh, plane ride. And I was sitting in, the, the interview was a two and a half day interview. The last part was me sitting in a cubicle for two and a half hours. And every half an hour, another Intel employee rotated into my cube and ask me a series of behavioral-based questions centered around a specific subject. So one was on risk. The next person asked me about conflict. The next person asked me about communication. The next person asked me about leadership and supervisory skills. But they were all behavioral-based questions. So you will see this without, throughout your entire career. And the more you prepare for those questions now, the better you, are, you will be at answering them. And what's really great is, the more you practice with these typical interviewing questions and these behavioral-based questions, your responses will seem natural. You will, it, what you want to do in the interview is not seem like you are reciting a sentence that you've memorized, 
but rather that you're engaging in a conversation. So you want to practice these questions, practice the interview with a friend, with a colleague, and so that you get used to answering these, these behavioral-based questions and these typical interviewing questions. And the last piece I want you to think about as you prepare for your interview is to recognize interview stimuli or challenges. And these are things that, that decision makers and hiring managers put into the interviewing equation both consciously and subconsciously. So here's two examples. Uh, Intel Corporation, going back to them, one of their tactics that they did in years ago, and I bet you they still do it, with when they would hire high-level sales candidates was to have the, have the interview take place, part of the interview would take place over a meal at a restaurant. And they would pre-arrange with the restaurant to mess up the meal in every way possible. Can you imagine? So the food would come out, it would be wrong or it would be over-seasoned, the forks would be dirty, the, the wait staff would be rude. So what Intel was doing was they were inserting these stimuli into this interview to see how the candidate would handle it. Would they handle it with class and professionalism and respect? Uh, would they just let it lie, you know, let it lie and not speak up for themselves? That could indicate that they wouldn't speak up for their customer or they wouldn't speak up for the company if something was wrong. So this was almost a behavioral question, but in the context of a challenge. And I did the same thing when I was interviewing candidates for a job that I had. So I, when, I, when I worked for the U of A physics department, I needed to hire a student assistant to help me in the public relations aspect of the position. And so what I did to introduce the stimulus, the stimulus that I introduced into the interview was I simply had the door to my office closed when the candidates would come for the interview. I wanted to see how they would handle a closed door. Would they be professional and knock on the door, wait for me to say enter, and then come on in? Would they run away screaming and crying? Would they crawl in a ball on the floor and start sucking their thumb? What would they do? I was challenging them to see what they would do, how they would behave in this, search, in this circumstance, to help me understand how they might behave in other circumstances that gave them challenges. And I'm happy to say that 9 out of 10 candidates actually did the most appropriate thing. They knocked and waited for me to say enter before they came on, came on in. But there's this one guy, one guy. And to this day, I must admit that I don't even remember the person who I hired, nor do I remember the gender of the person who I hired. I just remember that guy. That guy walked right into my office. He didn't knock. He just walked right in. He sat down in the chair in front of me, and it was one of those rocking office chairs and he rocked back and forth with his hands behind his head, rocking back and forth throughout the entire interview because he was clearly the man and he wanted me to know that. And what I learned from that was number one, I get CSEC very easily. And number two, he was so cocky, I couldn't, I didn't want to even be in the same room with him. He could have been the most brilliant public relations strategist, but his attitude and the way he responded to this stimulus of a closed door and then interacting with me with his hands behind his head like he was some cocky guy, this told me I did not want to have him on my team. And in fact, I, of course, did not hire him. So just be aware of these stimuli and these challenges and make sure that you approach them professionally, appropriately, politely, and with respect of everybody around. So let's take a moment to talk about the academic job talk, because I know many of you who are listening today are going to be going on for academic positions, and we all look forward to, and I say that with lots of glee and a little bit of a hilarity there, the fabulous job talk. How much fun is that? We could do job talks all day. We would, right? All right, so how do we prepare for the academic job talk? So within the academic realm, there are actually three, there's actually four, I call them the four problems or I actually call them the four horsemen as a joke, the four horsemen of academia, the four problems that you as a professor, you as an academic will be solving. You'll be solving research problems, you'll be solving teaching problems, you'll be solving outreach and service problems, and the fourth problem is money. You'll be raising money, you'll be writing grants. That sometimes gets um, lumped under research. For the purposes of the job talk, your job talk should demonstrate how you solve these three problems, research, teaching, and outreach. So the subject of the talk, where you're talking about your research, is going to emphasize 
you know, how you look at approach research problems, how you solve research problems, what research problems you've solved, what the solutions were that you came up with, and what the results were of your solutions. And you're also going to be demonstrating your teaching prowess, your teaching problems, how you solve teaching problems. That will come not only in the content of the talk, but also in the way you deliver the talk. And you'll also mention your outreach and service interests, too. So you're going to find out in advance what your time limit is, what the potential audience is, how they're advertising this job talk. Are they promoting this campus-wide, or is it just an internal department colloquium? Or is this a job talk that's specifically for anybody, or, or generally for anybody, or is it specifically for graduate students and postdocs in the department? And then what you want to do is you want to practice for an expert and a non-expert audience, because what happens is, is you cannot assume that everybody who attends your job talk is an expert in your subdiscipline or even your discipline. They could be, you might be in physics and biologists might want to wander in off the street to hear your talk for whatever reason because they know you're amazing. Okay? So you have to be able to communicate what it is that you do and what it is you can do for the department, right? That's that spin back. What it is you can do for the department in a way that everybody in the audience can at least understand it. So you're not dumbing your talk down. You never dumb your talk down. You are simplifying it in such a way that the audience understands what it is that you do and what it is you can do for them. So engage them about your research. Give them eye contact. Smile. Show them that you're enjoying the experience of sharing what it is that you do. Demonstrate your teaching abilities by giving them examples of not only what you taught in the content, but show them how you actually would teach a complicated subject, which is your research area, to a non-expert audience. Don't, uh, and watch your acronyms and watch your jargon. You can use jargon, you can use acronyms, but spell it out. Define them for the people in the audience just in case they, cannot, they don't know those particular words. But be careful with them. You don't want to use too many of them because you don't want to have them, let them uh, get lost. And you can discuss how you'll fit in with the department. So you can actually, as you're talking about the research problems you've solved, you could say, you know, and this experience solving X and working on X will really help me to be, it has really helped me to understand how X and X plus 1 are related. And so I'm especially excited to be here because I know Dr. Levine has been working on X plus 1 for the last few years. So I look forward to approaching the possibility of working with Dr. Levine if I were to join your department. By customizing your job talk for the department, you are again connecting the dots for the audience. You're connecting the dots for the search committee. They're starting to see how you would fit in, and you're showing them in a non-pushy way what it is that you could potentially do for them and with them. You're using words like, I'd love to explore the opportunity to work with Dr. Levine, or I think there might be a good fit or parallels between my work and Dr. Levine's work. You're not pushy. You're just saying, I see parallels, and I think there could be a way that we could collaborate, and that's why I'm very excited about your department. So mention those visions. Mention those ideas because people want to hear what it is that's special about that. So when you go to the interview, when you're actually at the interview, you're going to bring with you extra copies of your resume and your CV because I guarantee, even if you get a list of all the people that you'll be interviewing with, I guarantee you at least one of those people will not have gotten your CV in advance or didn't open it until today. Or there'll be an additional person that will walk down the hallway and your hiring manager or your search committee or your, decision, your search committee head or your decision maker who's standing next to you says, hey, Jared, you know what? You should talk to Elena. She's interviewing today for that position. I think she would be a good fit for your team as well. And then Jared pulls me into his office. I've never met Jared before. He doesn't know anything about me. But hey, I've prepared. I have an extra copy of my CV or my resume. I can give to Jared so I can immediately start having an educated and intelligent conversation with him. So I'm also going to bring extra copies of my reference sheet. That's a separate document from the resume and CV. You give that when you're asked. You don't have to present that. You're going to bring your talk on a laptop, on your iPad, on a thumb drive, as a PPT, as a PDF, as a handout, through carrier pigeons. You're going to telegram it in. You're going to fax it in. In other words, bring it on 16 different ways, 16 different actual platforms, because 15 out of 16 of those will fail. That is a guarantee. You're going to get up there to give your talk, and 16 out of 17 uh, you know, platforms will fail. But if you have it ready on another one, not only are you going to smoothly go into your talk, 
but it's going to show that you can handle any sort of problems, that you don't even skip a beat, you don't even miss a beat, you jump right into it and you are prepared. And that shows me something very significant about your behavior. You're going to bring a pad folio and a pen. I say don't bring something with a logo on it, and I make a joke about that, but it's kind of serious. If I was going for a job at Arizona State University, I would not bring my University of Arizona pen or my University of Arizona emblazoned pad folio. It just wouldn't be appropriate. So I'm going to bring something without a logo. And you can see that's an example of what I mean by a pad folio. So you can actually have extra copies of your CV and your reference sheet in there. You can take notes. You should come with questions already written down. Because you've done your research, you can already have questions written down on your pad folio. And quite honestly, while you're talking with me, while you're interviewing with me, I want to see that you're interested. You should be writing things down as you're talking to me. You don't want to be writing it down that, so that you're only looking at the pad. You should be looking at me in the eyes and then gently, very quickly writing something down and then looking back at me. So don't lose your gaze. Don't let me lose your gaze for 20 minutes while you're you know, hunkered over writing something down. Um, you can bring your thesis or your capstone project or portfolio and offer to give that if somebody wants it. You can bring business cards. Definitely bring appropriate clothing. And this is where having inside information about that company, about that organization is useful. You know, what you would wear for an engineering position at Lawrence Livermore National Lab is very different than what you would wear for a sales position at Intel and what you would wear for a medical physics position at a hospital. And so it's important to know what is the appropriate clothing for that particular ecosystem so that you dress appropriately. And you're going to dress in a better way than you would in a typical day in a lab. So even though you're, even though in a lab, even though like at Livermore, you're not going to necessarily wear a three-piece suit, you know, with shiny shoes and like matching tie tacks and, and uh, you know, um, couplings, but you are going to wear something that's a little bit more pressed and a little bit more professional. You're going to wear nice chinos that don't have any, um, you know, creases in them. You're going to wear a nice button-down shirt. Maybe bring a jacket if you need it. Um, same thing with the ladies. You can bring a nice skirt, not too short, a nice button-down shirt, a jacket if you care to. That would be for an engineering position. Sales position at IBM, you'd be wearing a suit uh, at black, brown, or gray. Um, but just this is where you can find out. You talk to your contacts, you find out what to wear, and then you'll feel most comfortable. And a tip, don't wear something brand new that you've never worn before to your interview. Because you want to feel comfortable and confident. And if you don't know how you fit or how you move in a new shirt, don't wear it that day. Wear it first another time, and then you can wear it again. Because who knows how you actually will move. If you're giving a talk and you lift up your hands, the shirt might come on up, you know, lift up, and your stomach's now showing. We don't want people to see that. So we want to know. You will, we want you to be absolutely 100% confident in that your clothing will be where it's supposed to be when it's supposed to be. The final piece of this preparing for you, for, but actually at the interview, is to bring with you that's kind of a joke, but it's serious also, a clean, cool hand. You'll be shaking hands all day. And so what you should do, in, especially in cultures in the United States, in the many Western cultures, and in a lot of Asian cultures, and in the Middle East too, we shake hands with the right hand. So carry all of your stuff, your briefcase or whatever it is, carry your stuff in your left hand, and keep your right hand open. And that way it doesn't become sweaty and gross. And you know what? <laughs> when I'm sitting and waiting for an interview, if I'm sitting in a, in a, in a, in a, in a um, lobby waiting to do an interview, I will actually sit with my right palm up on my, on my leg, on my lap, so that I'm not clenching anything. It's not getting sweaty because I'm getting nervous. It's, it's open to the elements. And so when I shake their hand, it's cool, it's clean, and it projects confidence and, um, and, and just, you know, it's just, it's just fantastic. So when we're at the interview, we're going to shake hands. We're going to smile at the people, show them that you're happy to be there. We're going to give them eye contact, say their name. When they introduce themselves, say their name back to them. You want to make sure you've got the right pronunciation. You want to make sure you know who you're talking to. And say your name. If they mispronounce your name, it's OK to correct them. Oh, I'm sorry, Dr. Lee. Actually, my name is pronounced Elena, not Alana. Do that. Stand up for yourself. If you don't stand up for yourself, they won't. So be enthusiastic, be polite, be respectful. Discuss their needs in terms of your experiences using their vocabulary, just like with the cover letter. Show them that you'll be able to jump in now by giving them specific examples. When they say, give me an example where you had 
uh, a conflict with a team member, how did you solve that? What they're asking you is, tell me about a problem you solved associated with that. What was your solution, and what were the results of your solution, and how did that help you prepare to add value to my team right now? So those are those four pieces that we talked about earlier you're going to be emphasizing with every response to every question. And be ready to ask questions that are technical in nature, business in nature, or even job-like like, job -like in nature. In other words, will there be travel involved? What conferences will we be attending? That sort of thing. And for those of you that are not early career, those of you that are mid-career and later, you should consider offering a 30, 60, 90 day plan. This is something that you would not use for your first job. You would not use it for a postdoc. But you would use it for a mid-career position, for a leadership position, and something you know, a little bit more senior. It's a way of telling the audience, a way of telling the people that you're interviewing with, the decision maker, I've really thought about this. And in the first 30 days, this is what I expect to be doing. In the first 60 days and 90 days, this is what I expect to be doing. And when you present that plan, what happens is, is now the interview has now turned a corner, and you're now running the interview. Because now they're going to be asking you questions from that plan. So that's useful for you to think about for your future. For those of you that are early career, don't do it right now. I wouldn't do it for the first job. That might appear cocky and too pushy. But if you're applying for a leadership position in a few years, this would be totally appropriate and would give you a competitive advantage. Within the academic environment, expect to be interviewing the whole day. Prepare multiple versions of your brand statement, in other words, of your introduction of who you are. And remember that anything that's a casual conversation, like with the dean or the department head, is it actually a casual conversation? Of course not. It's not a casual conversation. It's still part of the interview. Remember, the interview is always happening, especially when you're physically there. So make sure that you put as much effort into having that conversation with the dean and think of, thinking of it as a formal interview, even if he or she calls it a casual conversation. And remember that some professors who are on the nominating committee or on the search committee or are um, making, helping to make a decision. In other words, they have a vote to hire you, only come to the talk. They actually don't do interviews. Some professors don't do interviews. They just come to your talk, which is why explaining and demonstrating in the talk itself how you solve research, teaching, and outreach problems is so vitally important. You know, in your talk, in your job talk, as you're, as you're giving your talk, and then you say, you know, does anybody have any questions? Or if somebody interrupts you with a question, Every time somebody asks you a question, you're going to be polite, you're going to express appreciation, express gratitude. Thank you so much. That was a great question. And if you don't know the answer, that's okay. You know what? Thank you so much for asking that question. It's a great question. You know, I don't know the answer right now with this data, but I'd be happy to talk to you later. Let me get your email address after we conclude, and I'd be happy to follow up with you later. That's a perfectly fine answer to the question. And we all know that occasionally in academia, there are going to be a few jerks here and there. I know it's shocking. I know you never would have expected that in academia you'd find a jerk. But there are a few out there. And if they come to your talk and they try to trip you up by asking you a question that they know you don't know, or they know is completely way beyond off the, off the spectrum of your expertise knowledge, you still are going to be polite and appreciative because you're on stage. Everybody's watching you how you handle that stimulus, right? So you're going to say, thank you so much for that question. You know, that's not something that I know about or can answer right now, but I'd be happy to talk with you later. Thank you so much. Who else has a question? And you just go on to the next person. So don't let them trip you up. Don't let them mess you up. And just remember that there will be jerks there. With Skype interviews, the key is being professional. We want a stable connection with quality video and sound. We want to understand what the camera is looking at, right? The location is very important. If the camera looks at you, if you're doing, and this is why you want to practice your Skype interviews with people in advance, if the camera sees only the top of your head, as is the case with me because I'm very short and my camera is very high up, I actually have to sit on a dictionary when I do Skype interviews. I also have behind me a very messy office. So if I'm doing a Skype interview, I'm going to clean that up. I'm going to remove all that stuff behind me so that what they see is something clean and fresh and professional. My clothing is going to be representative of my professionalism. So I'm going to wear clothing that's appropriate for the experience. Of course, I can wear my pajama bottoms, but at the top, my shirt and my jacket should look appropriate. And the lighting is important, right? So you need to make sure that people can see your face. 
and this is really important, I know you're good looking. I know that you're gorgeous. In fact, the only people that ever come to my webinars are really seriously good looking people. So I know you are really, really, really good looking, but don't look at yourself during the Skype interview. Look at the camera, okay? Look at the camera, don't look at yourself. You can look at yourself later. And during the Skype interviews, you can take notes, you should have notes, practice with a friend, and you can use your hands, but this is where even recording your Skype interview practice sessions are useful because you'll see where your hands appear in the screen. And if it looks like it's kind of weird with these fingers sort of popping up into the camera screen, into the, you know, the vision, then you want to stop using your hands or you want to modify how you use your hands. Interviewing no-nos. I know it seems almost silly that I would list this like that you shouldn't pick your nose or you shouldn't scratch yourself or have gum or candy in your mouth, but you won't believe how many interviews I have been on where I've been the interviewer. And people have come in to interview with me for positions, and they have done every single one of these in the interview. So we want to make sure you don't do these. Um, in fact, once I was on a team of people interviewing somebody who was going to be a fundraiser for the University of Arizona, development director, whose job was going to be to raise millions and millions of dollars for the college. And when I walked into the room to look for the candidate, I couldn't find the candidate because the candidate was standing on the sides of her feet like she was a little kid. She was popping gum in her mouth. It was so loud I could hear it from across the room. And she was twirling her glasses in her hand like she was just standing on the street. And I didn't even realize that was the candidate until we actually sat down. So she immediately had given me a negative impression. These are the things you want to be aware of. And that's why when you practice, you'll note these are some of the things that you might be doing and you didn't even realize it. And this is why you can actually help to um, you know, make a better impression by really polishing your experience. Now at the end of the interview, in other words, at the end of the formal part of the interview, you always want to leave and let them know you're excited about this position. You know, thank you so much for the opportunity to speak with you today. You know, as a result of our conversation, I'm even more excited about joining your team, and I'm even more confident that I'll be able to be an asset to your organization. I'm looking forward to working with you. And that's what you can actually say as you conclude your interview. You can ask for their business card. You should get the business card or contact information of everybody that interviews you, especially in those academic job uh, interviews which go on for all day. You want to be able to send a thank you note to every single person. It can be the same thank you email, but don't do it in a batch. Do it a single email for each person where you thank them for what they did and, be, and, and express appreciation and express this uh, you know, excitement about the job. And be proactive. Ask them about the timeline during the interview. That should be one of your questions. And then if they say, you'll hear from us in two weeks and it's been more, you can be proactive and follow up and say, you know, I just wanted to check back with you, see if you had any other questions, if there was any more information I could provide for you. I'm still very excited and, and thank you very much. Now, if you don't get the job, don't freak out, okay? Don't burn any bridges. Send a thank you note and stay connected because they're now in your network. You know, many years ago, the dean called me into his office and said, Elena, we're opening up, we just got a grant, we're opening up a new job, I want you to apply for this job. And I thought, wow, that means I'm going to get the job. So I did prepare a little bit, and I wore a suit to the interview. In fact, the interview was with professors, physics professors, that I had known since I was 17 years old. So I wasn't really nervous. But by the way, before I went into the interview, I Googled and practiced typical interview questions, because that was what they major the majority of the questions they asked me were all those typical interview questions that I mentioned earlier. So I did the interview. I did pretty good. I thought I did great. And then the dean calls me a couple days later, and he says, Elena, guess what? You're not going to get the job. And I said, why? I don't understand. And he said, well, you know, what happened was we opened the job. They, because it was a university, they had to open the job and advertise it, you know, freely. And somebody else applied for the position, and she just had way better credentials than me. He could not help but hire her over me. And I said, you know what, I understand that completely. I sent him a thank you note. I sent, I sent note, in the note, I wrote, you know, I completely understand your decision. I'm, of course, disappointed. But if I can be of any other assistance to you in the future, please let me know. And you know what? Six months later, he left to become provost at another university. A new dean came in. The new dean moved that particular person who had got, gotten that job that I wanted, moved her to head a new department, and now the job was vacant again. And the new dean had known me, so he called me into his office, and it wasn't even an interview. It was a matter of when can you start, Elena. So this idea of 
that there's always a possibility if you don't get the job the first time around, you could get it the second time around if you stay connected is very important. I have a colleague just recently, he did the one year, you know, he did the full year search uh, activity with a particular nonprofit institution um, in a leadership role, and he was one of two candidates. They offered the job after the year of, of interviewing and everything, all the stuff that goes on, in, goes into um, an interview on the job search and selection process of the job of this magnitude. He did not get an offer. They gave the offer to this other person. He sent them a thank you note. I understand. Let's stay in touch. If I can help you in the future, I'd love to because I'm committed to your company. And three months later, in the summer, they email him, and now they are desperate. They have a problem. The person they wanted to hire has reneged on the offer, and now they have to decide whether or not they're going to bring in this, the original person, my colleague, or they're going to have to start the entire job search process again and do wait another year for the process to, to formalize and to actually you know, give them a candidate. So now my friend was in a really good position, and they came to him. And he said, I'd be happy to do it. He interviewed one more time, and they offered him the position. He got it, and he's loving it. So if the opportunity presents itself, you might be the first to know to get the position, even if you don't get it this time around. So connect with them. Invite them to connect on LinkedIn. Stay connected. Let them know what you're working on so that you can be surprised of when the opportunities are available. Contrasting for success, I just mentioned earlier, you want to be a better version of yourself, a more polished version of yourself at the organization. Some final thoughts as we conclude today. You're interviewing them as much as they're interviewing you. This is very important. You want to take note of how they treat you, how they treat their staff, their colleagues, everybody around them. I once went for an interview, a radio uh, promotions interview, where the interview itself took place in what would be my office. The office was the size of a closet with two desks slammed into them, slammed into the room. The desks were right next to each other, and I would be working literally two atometers away from my boss every day. How comfortable is that, right? Okay, so we did the interview in that office, and my boss, my, my would-be boss, is interviewing me. And in the middle of the interview, his secretary pops her head into the office. He screams at her, throws his keys at her, and tells her to go wash his van. That moment was the moment for me when the interview ended. He rudely disrespected his staff in front of me. I could just imagine in my mind, if he was doing that in front of the public, which was me, what he would be doing in private. This was very troublesome to me, especially since I'd be working two atometers away from him. Now, I didn't give him any indication at that moment that I was not going to be working for him. I could finish the interview with flying colors, kept the enthusiasm, kept the energy level up, kept the politeness up, even though he wasn't polite. And I did not respond. Uh, you know, I didn't. I didn't pursue the matter further afterwards. In other words, I didn't. Um, you know, follow up or do anything to actually get a job with him because that moment was the moment I decided there was no way in heck I could ever work for somebody who treated their staff like that. So when the interviewer makes a mistake, like if they make your, if they call you by the wrong name, you can say, "Oh, excuse me. I just want to make it clear. My name is Elena, not Alana." Um, sometimes they make an even bigger mistake, like once I went for an interview and somebody said and I had done astronomy and physics research, they looked at my resume and they asked me why I decided to study astrology. It was so hard. Why would you study astrology? That's so hard. And I responded by saying, well, you know, the reason I studied astronomy was because I did this and this, and I was able to do X and Y, which has given me experience to be able to do this for you. And he said, yeah, but astrology, that's hard. He didn't get it. So that was also a moment where I realized if he doesn't know the difference between astronomy and astrology, this might be a challenge for me to work for somebody like that. So I probably don't want to work for somebody like that. But I didn't interrupt him. I didn't say, hey, moron, it's astronomy, not astrology, and there's a difference. Um, but maybe he just was born under the wrong sign, and that was why he made the mistake. Um, but I am going to treat everybody at the organization with the utmost respect because people are watching me especially the admin associate, that admin who handles your logistics, your travel, your schedule, they can be very helpful to you. If you're sitting waiting 20 minutes and you're, the person has not come to interview you yet, they can whisper to you, you know, Elena, don't worry, he's late all the time. So you realize that it's not you. So definitely 
be respectful to the administrative associate and send him or her a thank you note. They are the person who gets thanked the least in the office. So when you make the extra effort to send them a thank you note, they are going to greatly appreciate it. They're going to go out of their way to help you, and then they're going to run into their boss, and they're going to say, look what Elena just sent me. She sent me this lovely thank you note, and that's another check plus next to your name to get you that job. So with that, I thank you so much for this opportunity to talk with you about interviewing. You are going to kick butt in your next interview. I just know you are. And what I'd like to ask as we conclude is we have a survey. And if you could please fill out the survey. And I'm going to send you a follow-up email with this URL in it as well. But if you take a look and make a note of it now, please fill out the survey so that the AIP Career Network knows what you think of these webinars and how we should be proceeding with these types of webinars in the future. That would be really helpful. And then also, I wanted to invite you to some upcoming webinars that are all going to be at 2 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. You'll be receiving promotions about these. The next one is on April 30th. I'm about to graduate. What on earth do I do now? In September, we'll be doing one on how to identify and seize value from conference participation. And then in November, we'll talk about how to transition your career beyond academia. And like I said, you'll be informed about all these different opportunities. But thank you again for this opportunity. I want to thank the AIP Career Network for their sponsorship of this type of activity. I want to thank you for, your, for taking time out of your day to, to attend this webinar and to listen. It really is a privilege and an honor to be able to present to you career topics of this nature. And I just want to invite you to join me on my social media networks. You can join me on Facebook by liking my Facebook group, Quantum Success Solutions. You can follow me on Twitter at Elena G. Levine. You can join my LinkedIn group, Elena's Alumni. I'm going to be sending you an invitation to that group as well. It's a career development group on LinkedIn specifically for scientists and engineers. And of course, I hope you'll be interested in my book, Networking for Nerds, which will be coming out this year uh, in, the, in the spring in a few months. So we do have a few moments for a few questions. And a couple of last minute things. This is being recorded, so you will get an email about where you can access this in the future. Especially if you join my LinkedIn group, you will be the first to know where this recording will be and when it will be lo when it will be posted. I'll be doing a follow up article in Physics Today, answering any questions that I don't have a chance to answer today, uh, and they will be all anonymized and the personal information will be stripped out. So if you have other questions, you can email me those questions at my email address there, elena at elenalevine.com, and I'd be happy to answer those questions. So I'm going to stick around for a little bit and answer some questions now, and then I'll answer the rest of them via uh, LinkedIn, excuse me, via that article that I'm going to be writing for Physics Today. And so thank you so much for all of your, uh, your, your interest in this webinar. So I'll go ahead and an answer some questions right now. So somebody said, asks, um, if somebody has a quiet or not perfect, let's see, how, how do they write this? If somebody has a quiet or not the perfect interview personality, is it better to be yourself during the interview or joke, laugh, and talk a lot? Like, that might, would that be expected? So, you know, there are introverts and there are extroverts. And what you want to do on the interview is you want to be yourself. You do want to be yourself, but you want to be a, the best version of yourself. So if you normally use humor in your day-to-day, -day, uh, like I do, you know, then that's totally fine for you to use humor. That's totally fine. If you're not somebody who uses humor on a regular basis, um, then you know, don't introduce humor into the uh, interview scenario because it will be uncomfortable for you. It won't feel like it's natural. Um, but what you can do is, you know, people who are shy, people who are quieter, quiet people, you do want to make sure that people can hear you, and you do want to speak up. And when you speak up, what you're doing is you're showing people that you have confidence in what it is that you stand for, and the work that you do, and what you could do for the organization. So when you're practicing your interviews and with your friends and with your colleagues, it's really, really helpful if you actually start practicing speaking more loudly, speaking more forcefully, more confidently about your expertise so that people understand what it is that you can do. That's a really great question. Somebody asked, how, um, I'm getting like, tons and tons of questions, so I, I, I won't be able to answer all of them today, but I'm going to do um, my best. So somebody asked, do you have any specific tips for telephone interviews? 
The same thing goes for Skype interviews and telephone interviews, except the best thing about tele telephone interviews is that since nobody's seeing you, you can spread all your notes out on the floor, on your bed, or wherever you're going to do the interview, and you can use, you can access all those notes. And I did that with my interview. One of my interviews I did with the, in fact, it was my first interview with the cable company to their promotion. Um, it was a telephone interview, and I put all of my paperwork, all of my research and notes about all the products and services and their competition and their annual reports and everything that I had researched. I put it out in front of me so that I could access it as I was talking with them. Um, I would do the interview on a landline if I possibly could, because then you can make sure that you don't have an issue with wireless going in and out. I would not do it in a car. I would not do it, uh, you know, um, in a box or you know, I would I would only do it, um, you know, in a quiet location. So you know what? If you don't have quiet in your home because of, of your family or because of whatever situation you have, you know what you can do is you can actually go to a library and you can actually potentially do it in the library. That might mean that you would have to use a cell phone, which I would recommend using against, but if it's a quieter environment and you get good reception, it still might work to your favor. So the, the key things with the telephone is, you know, prepare yourself, be ready about 10 minutes in advance of when they're going to be calling you or when you're going to be calling them. Um, have your stuff, all your notes ready to go. Um, have a secure location, have a quiet location. Make sure you shut off all your noise that you have in the background, you know, if you have another phone, move that to another room, so that nothing is inter interrupting you. And by the way, we didn't mention it, but the question of when does the cell phone, where does the cell phone fit into the interview, that's a trick question too, because you should never be taking an interview, doing an interview and taking a cell phone call. Never, ever, ever. Um, your cell phone should be shut off before you even enter the building. And not only that, but um, if for some reason, this is the only exception, if you have to keep it on because your wife, your, your spouse, your partner, or your kid, or whatever, is in the hospital, and you, you can't reschedule the interview, when you walk into the interview, let the interviewer know, you know, I'm so sorry, I have to apologize right from the start. My kid is in the hospital, or my, my parent is in the hospital. I have my cell phone in case they need to reach me. That's the only call that I would take, and I just wanted to let you know, and I'm sorry that I even have to do that. So um, another question somebody asked, let me, let me find a really good question. There's so many great questions here, and I'll be answering them in that um, article. Um, how do you approach your supervisor for giving you a positive reference? Really good question. Thank you for asking that. So, you know, your supervisor, that's a whole other ball game is how to deal with references. Because, you know, on the one hand, you don't want your supervisor necessarily to know that you're looking for a job somewhere else, right? Unless it's a postdoc or graduate position, your PI, obviously they know you're going to be moving on. Or if you're on a contract position, that's a different story. But if you're working for company X or university Y and you want to move into another company or into another division, you might want to be discreet. So you might not necessarily want to ask your supervisor for a recommendation. Um, that's a choice that you would have to make, whether or not you should ask them or not. I would say probably don't ask them, but ask people in the organization that you've networked with that know your work that can still talk about how great you are. However, the other side to this is if you do have a supervisor who you know is an ally, is somebody that really supports you, who um, really supports your career development, and understands that you know maybe you want to move to another division in the company because it's a great career opportunity for you, then that could be somebody that you could potentially ask for a, a letter of reference. Um, it's a gamble. You have to decide on your own. I can't say whether or not you should or shouldn't because I'm not in that scenario. I don't know the ins and outs of your relationship with that person. So we are now out of time and we still have tons of questions coming in. Like I said, they're all going to be answered on the, in the um, article on Physics Today. This has been recorded. You'll be able to access this later. I want to thank you again so much for this opportunity to speak with you. Um, it was a great, uh, great chance for me to share with you lots of tips about um, interviewing. And please stay in touch. Join me on LinkedIn. Join my group on LinkedIn. Follow me on Twitter and, and all those other places. And stay connected to the AIP Career Network because that's where you're going to get vital, critical, invaluable career information to move your career into the stratosphere and beyond. So thank you so much, everybody. This concludes our webinar today.
you rock.